Hmm. Yeah, I think that quality will do. I'm really doing 4,000 k bit per second, but I don't think YouTube likes too much more. I'm just going to wait for some people to turn up before I flip over to the overhead. Yeah, who am I kidding? I'll just flip over the overhead. There we go. Let's get a bit more of a zoom in. Thank you very much to Jim's awesome camera. Uh, Barry Stewart, Lodum, Yanko, Lars, and his jars. Let's disconnect this battery before I do anything stupider. Andrew, Riston, Daniel, Andre. All right, everybody's everybody's turning up. Uh, first thing I probably should do is actually see where my power supply window has gone. Oh, it was there the whole time. I was just blind. Okay, see what happens when we plug anything in. We'll put the chipmunk in. Uh, so this, so they say, sometimes lights up orange on the MagSafe, uh, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Okay, immediately green and spins, 165, it's alive. And we've got a green light, and we're booting an Apple logo. <laughs> oh, oh, crap. Uh, okay, so when we get this sort of behavior where the machine seems to be running just perfectly fine when it arrives here, we typically know to expect that we've got some sort of corrosion somewhere and the process of shipping has shaken things around, crumbled the corrosion, you know, just changed the parameters slightly, which now make the motherboard boot again. This is not a poor quality tech shop such as certain New Yorkers who seem to think that if the fan spins then it's a good to go. Uh, we actually investigate things here because we have a small amount of faith in the clientele that they wouldn't send us stuff unless they really wanted to, particularly because we're a long way away from most people. Okay, well we're 501. Of course I'm just mocking Lewis but that's fun. standard policy of my YouTube streams is to do my best to try and return as much of the vitriol that he sends my way. Riston, a pair of crappy Chinese OEM display today. Powerboard blend caps. Missing soldier. Oh, did you get it running? Hey Pete, where about you from, Pete? Hey Pedro, Pedro from the official I scam you company. Pedro is a world class I scam you consultant. He will travel great distances to come and get your Mac trash and pay you excellent prices from his perspective. So we're just going to take the main board out. There's no point trying to do any more testing. The person said it barely even runs. I mean, okay, maybe they had a bad MagSafe. Maybe. You don't know. But the least I can do is just take the board out and have a look. And not be overly surprised if we find a chunk of corrosion around, say, like the SMC or something like that. In fact, I see a little smidge there. Oh, no, that's a rubber, rubber bump. Nope, wrong port. There we go. That one goes in there. It's very handy having these containers. You know, there's only 15 compartments, but after a while you get used to 
when you disassemble the boards, even things like 1707s, 1706s, you start to be able to categorize different sort of sections for different areas. Definitely good containers to get. And you would be able to get them, except unfortunately, uh, as far as I know, Pedro bought all the stock that was in the world recently, leaving the rest of us with none. Apple Health. By the way, for those who have sent emails through to me and I have not responded with regards to the previous stream, it's nothing personal yet. I just yet <laughs> nothing personal yet. Um, I just haven't had a chance to respond to anything that's not explicitly business or relating to the clean-up process of events that have transpired. Alright, before we look at the underside, is there anything, nothing really showing up on the plastic sheet here, sometimes you can sort of play a game with yourself and see if there's any spots that you might recognise, so now we look at the board and, ah uh, oh yeah there we go, bam, right around the SMC, of course it is, it's always where the corrosion is. Because it's too hard to put the corrosion somewhere simple. Instead, it's got to risk it all on the SMC. Oh, well. Does Andre, I, I can't do that because I have to uh, interleave too many jobs. Like, I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five... There's 21 jobs in this room at the moment. So uh, I do have to switch them back and forth. Ah, oh, yay, that's nice. Yeah, so still, I should be thankful. It's visible corrosion. I'm going to look over the board and make sure there isn't something else lurking. Because as we know, it's easy to get target fixation and go and fix that one fault think that you've got a winner and then get caught out but so far looking good yeah yep that will certainly make a mess of it uh, no the SSD is removable on these boards it's not until the next um, not until you get to the 1706s and stuff, 1534s. These ones, they're just RAM chips. I'm just going to check the top side as well. Actually, I didn't check to see if the scanner works at the moment. I haven't used the scanner in a few weeks. Does it work? It does. There you go. Hello, it's Al Samari. Stuck in the overhead cam. And the overhead cam isn't even working. Oh well. Peter Finn, it's um, 10.30 in the evening here, roughly. Okay. So pretty much at this point, that's janitorial work, but we're going to actually have to remove all the affected parts there. That sort of corrosion is bad enough that you have to remove those parts. Mm. 
By the looks of it, it should not have gotten under the SMC, so I'm happy for that. Yeah, it's just a piece of wood. Grass, actually, I think, or something. Maybe a bit of tobacco. Yeah, these three parts here, they, they're all going to have to go. They're too messed up. Oh, that one just came straight off on its own. What we are going to have to fight against here is um, track damage. Hey, Sudi. And I can already see that one probably has gone down to the Via Stalk. Hopefully not. But I won't be surprised. Hey Chaz. Alright. Let's do some scrapey scrape. Just to give us an idea of what we're dealing with. Yeah, that's nasty. Obviously, this is definitely going to go into the ultrasonic afterwards. So, this one, I'm pretty sure it goes into this large trace here. I hope, because that'll make for an easy fix. Otherwise, it's going to be a pain. These ones have corroded over quite impressively, actually. That's just a test point. You do have to be careful. Some test points are, in fact, hiding veers underneath them. Oh, Paul, you've got uh, Starlink on sign up. Cool. I would do it except for the fact that I don't really need to have Starlink here. I'm already getting... 140 so um, so there's no compelling reason for me to get it man look at this nightmare here just like grab any blade pull any blade pick a blade and try not cut yourself I presume most of you who care have seen that the Starship number 10 did a reasonable landing considering it only had three legs to land on and then sadly decided to go bang. But still, that was pretty good going. Daniel Eklund? Ah, come on, man. Starlink's also useful if you want to bypass someone sniffing your packets in the country. Yeah, it's going to have to be a little bit delicate here and just want to get back down to some sort of copperish looking surface. This black stuff is not good. Usually around about now I can get some solder and flux onto it and it will, the flux will tend to eat away that last bit of blackness. But 
the CD is what makes them interesting. They're throwing money and prototypes at the job. It makes for excellent engineering. Just, it's, I'm guaranteed almost, but just for the sake of 100% checking, I'm going to verify where that pad goes. If it doesn't go there, I'll be shocked because I can't see a veer and I can't see any other option. Now, Travis, in terms of getting good blades, I bought mine from a hobby shop in America probably about 12 years ago so these are the ones I've got now they do a good job they've lasted me a while but they still break there's not much you can do about that really all right so we are looking at pretty sure this here yeah this is what we're looking at so that's a cap. Okay. AVSS and ground. And yeah, it goes to that test pad there, which I can see. So it's all good. Hey, JCT. Do you get any damage from the offshore cyclone? Not me, no. The banana plantations were beaten up a bit, but that happens every damn time. There's a decent breeze around here. It's not a business I would enjoy being in because it seems like every year something comes along and ruins your crop. Okay, there, we can see very clearly that how those are all connected. So we're going to be a cheat, grab two at once here. Hey Keith. Somebody forgot to put the flux down. Don't make me regret my decision. Don't worry, we'll separate them out in a second. I should have just done it one at a time. Sometimes it just goes perfectly smoothly, but then as soon as I go on YouTube, it doesn't. Uh, Paul Marrow, yes, I have actually uh, owned the house now for a month. So yes, that's all going good. And I've got desires of buying a new property now already. There's a property behind us that I want to get so that I don't have to put up with people. I just want to buy the property, gut it. It's mostly empty anyway. It's got a terrible house on it that's going to cost me... It's one of those houses that make the property value drop compared to, say, if it was just bare land. 
because you know you have to get all the removals done you know uh, what do you call it, uh, demolish it and it's got uh, asbestos and all that sort of stuff oh yeah I'm, I'm going to be drilling holes in the walls yes not that I was stopping before but <laughs> before I felt a little guilty about it, now I don't have to, now I can just feel more like, is this really what I want to do, do I want to put holes in my walls <laughs> now I'm going to have to think about it rather than just feeling guilty about it. Um, Miles, it's something you do just get used to after a while. You can't, like, I, I was the same. When I first started working at this sort of level, you're right, you know, you'd be holding a little part, even a 402, in your tweezers, and you turn your head, just something as simple as turning your head, and poing, you know, that it'd go flying off into the distance. But after a while, you do get to know your tweezers and the strengths, and your hands just naturally hold it at the right uh, tension. It's just something that comes with time, that's all. I've got a magic trick on that. Oh, you're finally building your house. Cool. What's, uh, what sort of size is it? Little two, three bedroom? No bedrooms? Fully studio type house? No, what do people go for these days? Yeah, Travis, the trouble is these walls are block, solid 220mm thick block, so I wouldn't want to redo them. Okay, the interior ones are actually only 150 solid block, the exterior, ah, oh, stop it, I'm not going to use the wire, I'm just going to go like that. That's a perfect bridge. <laughs> Paul Mary, make a stew. Four and a half by twelve. That's actually not too bad a size. Enough for one sort of person to be in, I guess. Is it just yourself that's going to be in it? And maybe the occasional visitor? Now I'm going to test this bridge blob. If it retracts away when that all heats up, then I'll wire it in. But that's looking sturdy. See how it held itself just fine there? So that's fine. It's not very often that I am content to leave a blob bridge like that, but that one I actually am. I said very infrequent for me to be tolerant of that. Now the next thing on my mind is if I should take away the edge bonding and give the SMC a bit of a, um, a reflow on a prod. I'm kind of thinking I want to, simply because if there is something under there, I want to flush it out before it goes through the ultrasonic. Okay, Paul, that'll be a good size for you. What about yard? How's it for the yard or the no yard where you are? What are these little things? I see so many boards with what looks like these salt crystals, but they're not. You heat them up and they go all fuzzy. I don't know what they are. I suppose I could lick one and find... <laughs> do a Jason Vilma. Guy's crazy. Ah, oh, shoot. Okay, I'm cooking up that whole board. Probably because I forgot to turn the temperature down. Black Magic needs to lower their prices. You trying to buy some um, encoder boards or something? Capture boards, Sonia.
Damn it. I hate it when you're breaking off like that. Watch out for those tiny bits of underfill, uh, not underfill, edge fill, because they can disrupt or they will disrupt the process of giving this a bit of a tap. But this will also give our little um, solder bridge a test as well. Because I could completely botch this up and end up having to reball the damn thing. All because I wanted to clean something. Okay, I think it's just moved. Yeah, I think I effed that up. Oh, and it's bloody hot. T I mean, it's hot. Uh, a bit of edge bonding there. Blamer. Uh, it looks like it might be okay. Yeah, a little bit of edge bonding there. Didn't get it out. Silly me. Uh, Pedro, I'm using 420. What do I use? Sorry, 460 and 110. Great, my toothpicks just all fell down. You know yourself though, it varies depending on the person. Oh wait, we didn't cool it off. Ha, g'day ZX. Good to see your prehistoric head turn up. Just cooling off the SMC, that's all. Uh, Chaz, predominantly left, but all left handed are ambidextrous. Hey Christensen. Ah, uh, Christian rather. Golly. Ah, that should be cool enough now. Kind of not really that much fun though, when you already know that it was working. And all you've got is to go down. <laughs> so, uh, kind of being a bit risky here. All we can do is worse. <laughs> It looks like we've done worse. 27, we got that right. Yeah, <laughs> we made it worse. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, come on, seriously? I'm gonna have to reball that SMC. I should have left it alone, but I was worried there was going to be a little smidge of junk under it. <laughs> I think everybody conspired against me on that one. Well, I'd be very surprised if that solder, um, the solder bridge is fine. 
I would have been very surprised if that would cause it anyway, because it's just, you know, it's not going anywhere. Alright, looks like we've got ourselves an SMC job then. Oh well. I suppose there are worse ways to spend my Friday night. Unless we have missed another piece of corrosion somewhere. I mean, the board is pretty nasty. Beautiful thing is, it's probably missing PM Sleep S4L now. Oh, fun and games. Here we go. Should have known better. Being stubborn. I don't really like doing the whole twist it to get her off thing because you can just have one solder ball that's holding on a little tighter and you do the whole twist off method and you won't feel it but that will probably rip out a pad and then you'll actually have something to cry about rather than just the fact that you're going to have to do a re-ball. Give me my heat. Well, uh, that was my own dumb fault. I should have left well enough alone. Or at the very least, I should have tested it before I did that. Oh, Rilla. Joshua, well, I do believe it potentially was, but who knows. Anyway, let's clear up this, these pads in a way that we're not going to risk ripping them, thus satisfying both iPad Rehab and Lewis Rossman at the same time. And except the image is fuzzy. How did you contact Amtec last time? Um, I just um, I just ordered a box of I think ten or twenty tubes. Uh, they've got their own. They've got their online ordering page. Okay, stick some flux down so that we don't have too much oxidization by the time we come back to this I mean we should not normally but hey yeah you know, 10 minutes it might be enough all right
Nevadme. We do this process so that we can clear away any tarnished solder and try and fix up a few of those pads that see they don't want to take solder initially and then we just sort of force them easier to do it now at this process rather than when you've got the stencil on there and you're just trying to desperately trying to coax it to take the solder ball and it's like no I don't want it so I'm trying to give a kid broccoli or something it's Brussels sprouts Okay, I think we're good. And let me just wash this off. Getting the flux off with ah, as long as you don't drop it. Just between the fingertips is usually just fine. Obviously, only if you're wearing gloves. If you're not wearing gloves, don't do this. It's a bit of a mess. dry out that recess you don't want you don't want flux and liquid sitting in that recess because if you do okay that's not too bad it's not great but it's not too bad oh look that damn that damned bit of whatchamacallit still the edge bonding or whatever But anyway, yeah, you don't want... Oh, great, there's cat hair. Fantastic. Flux or other things like that. Sitting around too much in this holding area. Because otherwise what will happen is as you heat it up to reflow, it uh, has a bad habit of wicking up and under your stencil and messing up the whole process. Okay, we will just spotting down a little bit of yeah you know the focus on this is botched up tonight it's because my eyes have changed that's why I'm not gonna be able to get much better than that for the moment Oh, g'day, Walter. Walter, I um, have got your emails and stuff. I'm sorry, I just haven't had a chance to reply. It's as you can well imagine. Okay, I've got the wrong pair of tweezers for this job. Uh, still making do. See, so, do I need to clean this? Yes, I do. It's filthy. Everything's filthy today. Uh, Walter, sorry to hear the method doesn't work for you. Guess it's a good thing there's many other methods.
Yeah, I did a couple of these earlier today, no trouble at all, but no, now that there's YouTube people watching it all just goes to trash. Okay, that's better. That's probably a few too many balls. Oh well. Perfect. All right, now we drive off the excess alcohol. And we just, basically we're just gonna heat it up until the balls start to deform. Now there's no flux on there at the moment. We're just waiting for the deforming balls. Second now, here they come. Okay. And give us a good douse of flux. I hope we not pick up any balls that we're not supposed to. Good. If things get too cold, then you pick up things that you're not supposed to. Okay, and now the reflow. Uh, looks like there's a bit of moisture in there. Watch out for the ones that don't pop back. There's one here. Okay, they've locked in. Can't see any others. Uh, Walter, yeah, these are 0.35s. If you go smaller, then you'll end up with two in a hole. If you go larger, then you end up with, well, it just won't fit properly anyway. So 0.35 seems to be the perfect mix for this particular stencil. Because yeah, when I originally got these stencils and they said 0.3, I was like, okay, I'll use 0.3. And I used 0.3 and it was like, man, there's like double ups everywhere and stuff like that. So I thought, well, I'm not going to put up with that. So I went to the 0.35 and it was like, hey, that actually works really well. Now, uh, this is just a jig, random jig from a, um, a vice like a little circuit board vice. I now <laughs> I'm trying to think where is it? Oh there it is. Uh, yeah, it was from one of these kind of vices. And it's just the board that fits in there for the memory um oh sorry there. And it was just pure luck that one of them happened to work reasonably well for an SMC. And that is how that happened. Hey, and W. EMC squared 
Now, I used to use paste all the time, and then I found though for the SMCs, for, any, for anything pretty much above 0.3, I found I had a preference for balls over the paste. So in the end, it just comes down to the personal thing, of course. And I also like having this single side, you know, this tweezer that I've split in half. Excellent for when you want to pin something down. Alright, I'm just going to shift closer to the exhaust hood. Yeah, Paul, I just rebooted the machine. I think the machine had been sitting around for too long and I was having contention issues with the USB. And so I just gave it a reset and it seems good now. In saying that, I'm probably now going to be cursed with it mucking up. By the way, Pedro, when I put these SMCs back on, I'm down to 80 litres per minute of air rather than 110 just to stop it blowing around too much and since it's already got leaded balls on it it doesn't matter as much, you know, it's going to reflow a bit sooner I found at 110 I was running into the risk of blowing the chip off all the time Ooh, that was a <laughs> that was more than just a little way out, that was a long way out. Okay, now it's dancing, so that's good. Yeah, Paul, that's right. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Now Miles, I think what the problem is is that a lot of my software that I use for managing things like the cameras and the sensors like the uh, microscope switch sensor, uh, reading of the barcode scanner, uh, just everything, there's probably a few leaks in my software and maybe I'm polling things you know, the wrong way and so eventually yeah, it just gets upset and it wants a reboot. Oh and of course yeah, the power supply and the micro um, what do you call this thing the multimeter so they're all they're all running my dodgy software so it's no surprise just cooling off that SMC Yeah, it's it's nice EMC when the uh, when those chips dance because you know you've got it down and yeah it's sitting in its correct location, especially when it doesn't dance skew. I hate it when you see a chip sit down and then it just like says I don't want to sit here, and you're like ah oh, great I've I've dodged up one pad or something like that yeah. Alright folks, for extra measure we're going to actually put the fan in this one just to try and will the spirits of MacBooks past to do the right thing. Yes, fan spin, okay that's only the half, okay so we just landed um, Starship, but now we've got to make sure it doesn't blow up. We wait for the green light to say all is good. Come on, give me a green light. Yes, all right, we're all good. So, obviously, what happened then was when I was trying to re uh, tr try clean up that SMC because I was worried about there was junk under there, or at least some dregs of it because I didn't get that little smidge of edge bonding out when I did the tap I obviously sheared off something anyway so all reset so that's good hey Sinclair uh, and now I've got a dirty main board you even though I've got the ultrasonic cleaner I do like to try and 
reduce the amount of flux that I'm throwing into that tank. Mostly because the cleaning fluid still costs me about $30, $40, yeah, $30 to $50 for a full tank every time I flush it. Yeah, it's not the cheapest stuff. So if I can absorb as much as I can outside of the tank, all the better. And I'll probably have to flush the tank every month, which is pretty good. Uh, let's stick this in a assembly and see how it looks. Make sure it really is actually booting. I mean, given that I'm getting the green light, I'll be very surprised if I'm not, but I'm not willing to take that to a chance. Not today. What's this? What's Northridge do? Paper towel, cut down paintbrush with IPA. Oh, yeah, I mean, I do usually often, like, okay, I haven't got a cut down one, but I've got the toothbrush. The only reason why I didn't bother doing that then is because I just sometimes just want to use the hot flux. It gets dabbed up by the paper towel well enough. You'll see in my other videos that I do frequently do the wash down with the brush and alcohol onto paper towel. Just didn't do it this time. Sometimes your mood just says, nah, I don't feel like doing that tonight. It's weird, I thought someone was coming in here. My wife, for instance. I have to make up excuses for what I'm doing. she come in here and say, what are you doing? And I'll be like, playing games? Ach, niemand. Oh, come on. I don't know. Someone else like a spooky person or something. You never know. The feds. I am definitely hearing something banging around here. There's a great big green frog out there. Spying on me. Pervert. By the way, green frogs, they are not actually that nice a creature. Okay, don't look at beautiful looking green tree frogs and think, oh, what a sweet little animal. They're cannibalistic little SOBs that will basically eat anything they can get their, you know, anything they can cram in their mouth, they will eat. Including, you know, younger green frogs and things like that. There is nothing sweet and adorable about them. It's all a lie. Do you really want to do this, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever tried reflowing ream chips on? I, um, some part of my old brain tells me that I have. On a back in when I was pretty desperate to get a stick to work for some job. It's not something I would normally do, though. Oh yes, on your sure. It's um it's called Ambacil. I guess the reason why I haven't listed it is because I think it's absurdly expensive and it seems to only be really from one supplier. So it'd be Australian specific. And in all honesty, I'm kinda of wondering if I can't come up with a formula myself. There's gotta be some kind of mix I can shit. 
Damn it. Doc. That was not supposed to happen. Ah, oh, jeez. Oh, well. Okay, we didn't get a bong, or at least I didn't hear a bong. If you have something like a, what is it, 3209, or, you know, one of those 2012 1466 boards that give you three beeps, just walk away from them, just walk away. On the other hand, if you have something like a 1278, um, 86, or what's the other one, 92, you know, any of that sort of type, one where they've got the double slots in them, then usually it's just one slot that's failing. And all you can do is just shift to only one slot and double up the size of that RAM. No bongs? Okay. That's probably a PRAM fix away anyway. I, well, even if I didn't plug in the speaker, there is the one on the daughter board, uh, on the DCM board, so that should fire off. Okay, so we've got a fully charged battery. Temperatures are looking okay. lagging a little bit not a lot what have we got We've got a 1.88 okay so it's high end board uh, speaker test yep that's fine mic's fine bass time is fine the um, trackpad button's a little bit shonky. Keyboard's fine. Definitely the trackpad button's a little iffy. And we haven't picked up the SD card yet. So it could be a problem there. definitely works, I know it works. I mean, using it all day on other machines. The frame rate's good, 34, 35, yeah, that's pretty good. But yeah, we do not have, appear to have SD card reading. Oh, now it is, okay. There must be corrosion on the contacts. It's working. No, I'd say it's just contact corrosion. Okay, so this machine checks out fine. Wi-Fi is good. Make sure it runs off battery. Make sure it sleeps. And it wakes up just fine, except I put the password in wrong. Make 
Actually, we should probably check the charge. So, since it's fully charged, we need to run it down a bit. Because as far as I understand, the logic of the uh, charge controllers on these is that they won't start charging until it drops below 95% on the battery. So we're at 100% at the moment. So, uh, Walter, that's a program I wrote. Uh, let me get the link for you. I'll wait for that to... Ah, uh, looks like Christian's already got it. <laughs> you will find pretty much all of the software things I have written, other than Flexboard View, on GitHub. So if you go to my GitHub in general, that's it there. Hey Warren, how's it going? Hey, you're showing your face now on your avatar picture. I don't remember you showing your face before. No worries, Walter. Yeah, you'll just probably have to compile it. Um, but if you got if you're already running Brew, that shouldn't be a problem. Ah, oh, I see Andrew Hughes is here. Did I say hello to you, Andrew? Sorry if I didn't. Okay, we're still at 100% battery. Oh, man, this is... Let's see what our temperature's getting up to. I think we need to change the settings. Turn on some anti-aliasing. Okay. Uh, Paul, Jason put up something not too long ago. He's doing just fine. He's actually been a responsible repair person and focusing on making sure he gets his customer devices out before he does YouTube videos. He's got his priorities right, unlike, say, myself who seems to prioritize doing endless repetitive videos but uh, results in substandard quality sometimes. Okay, interestingly the hardware monitor shown 97 but the status bar shows 100 still. Hey Ian Morris. Hey Maladen. Oh, man, come on. Uh, Moles, yes, I did see that right to repair passed. I don't know how effective it's going to be. And I saw one of the big things was they had to have a 10-year serviceability on the things. Whether we'll be able to gain access to any of the information that we need, such as board views, is hard to say. But I have a feeling that they may release such information, but make it extraordinarily constrained in how you can utilize it. Okay, we're down to 96% according to the hardware monitor and this thing up here still thinks it's 100%. That's almost as good as uh, Microsoft time schedule, uh, time prediction What's new with the house? We haven't been able to do too much at the moment because we still have... Um, it's still a very full house. Everybody's still in here. I don't have any room to really maneuver anything. It's a bit like, you know, those um, 
puzzles used to get as kids well in the 80s and whatever where it would be like a um, five by five tile configuration you can slide the tiles around but you always got to have that one tile that's missing well it's kind of like that here except that there's no tiles missing so you, we can't nothing can move yet but fortunately the other people in this house they have found a new house that they've um, I believe purchased now and once they start moving stuff out of here like as soon as one room becomes free here that will allow me to start actually doing things around the place uh, Luan Dante it um, probably it was supposed to be last month but unfortunately I got delayed but probably in the next couple of weeks I'll have it so that Flexboard View works natively with openboard data in a way that relies on nobody having to do anything really it'll just automatic auto magically happen the downside is and I don't know how this will go over the community the downside is there will need to be an internet connection to be able to draw the data down from the um, site so that's the only thing that's going to be different whereas currently flexboard view has no connectivity as in it's a completely silent program so far as internet connections go but in order to do the open board data properly or make it effectively I have to enable a connection so that's going to be the only thing that changes hey any triple five good to see you clocking in are you going to film any of your home repairs yes I probably will once everyone's once we've cleared out what we need to clear out I'll probably do a video showing just how bad it is in here I mean looking behind me looks bad enough but that's you know, by no means the worst it's a big project but for the most part we are more happy that we actually own or you know we kind of own the property that's the main thing that was the keystone thing that we need to get done And once we had that, then we can you know, take a bit of a rest and then you know, get attacking into it later. Okay, we're down to 98. This is taking forever. Why can't this thing... Honestly, I should put one of my 1 amp discharging USB sticks in there. I can certainly feel the heat off this machine. It's very warm. Good for winter. Uh, Joshua, I will probably not make it access any sort of repository for a board views or schematics. It may put me into a legal grey water. At least with open board data, because it is definitely just third party data, there's, you know, there's, it's not an official reference or it doesn't even match anything that Apple would have. Uh, I'm not in any sort of legal grey area there so unfortunately as much as people would like me to be able to provide some kind of server based board view type service I just can't do that it would I can guarantee you by the within 10 seconds of me making that live I will probably get a cease and desist from Apple but open board data, that's not a problem at all. Yeah, speaking of Lewis, I do have to fix up his software for his multimeter and his power supply. He's encountering one of the classic issues that, well, one of many issues that Linux has in that when you reset the computer, you, it's a it's luck of the drawer as to what USB ports get assigned to what devices so what I need to do is improve the software so that it'll actually check the available connections in this case COM ports query the device if it is actually able to be opened because if there's an exclusive lock on it clearly it's not the one we're after and then you know it's like listen query and then listen for the data see if it works if it doesn't move on to the next things like that 
basically to make it um, Lewis proof. That's what I need to do. But yeah, it's always bugged me that Linux is like that. I mean, I, I kind of understand why, but at the same time, it is a major pain in the butt. I mean, I already fight enough with some of the Linux things. Like, if you try to run two printers on Linux USB that have the same model number, like, if you get two identical printers, they will not work properly uh, if you're using CUPS as your printer drive, uh, printer server, because the way CUPS identifies the printer is to query the um, IE. 1384 I think it is um, string anyway, th there's a IE standard string that the printer should give but the trouble is that they wrote cups in a way that it assumed that this string is going to be unique between printers but it's um, of the same model as in it would contain a serial number but it doesn't and so when you get two printers of the same type and you plug them in then cups has no idea how to differentiate between them and everything breaks. I fixed it. I sent a patch in to CUPS, which funnily enough is written by Apple, and they haven't applied it yet, but you know, I think the problem's going to be that the patch that I have ultimately breaks the existing systems. So they've got a bit of a situation where they either stick with what they've got and hope that people don't have two of the same printer, or they break everybody else. So I think they're sticking with the um, the situation that they've got now. Okay, Walter, take care. And, oh, look, we're below 93, 95%. We can now plug this in and check that it charges. Okay. Well, you're right, Pernov, yes. You can use UDEV, but that th that's the problem, though, is that you really... It's when it comes to general users, they're not going to go into UDEV and set up the rules. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, people are sort of going Linux is for, yeah, anyone can use Linux. It's you know, user friendly and all that, and it's not. You can't you can't fix that without going in and writing UDEV rules. So I don't consider that to be a solution really. I mean, it is a technical solution, but it's not really a proper user friendly one. It's not something that you can say to the person who runs a Mac. Just go plug in your devices, yeah. I mean, I've been using Linux since 95, 96. It doesn't stop me griping about it. Uh, NusaCat, the problem does come up a little more commonly though when it comes to multiple COM port devices, like if you have um, like a satellite receiver or something and then a multimeter and a power supply, then that definitely comes up. The other problem it really comes up with is if you've got multiple cameras, like in this situation I've got this face camera, um, I used to have the overhead which is also USB. And you'd never know, well as it is, I'd never know which one of my HDMI capture ones are going to come up. So the problem does manifest in a very real way for general users. Uh, Carlos, yeah, some um, programming, I'll get there eventually. I'm just going to shut this off to let it charge faster. The real reason why I think that none of this is actually resolved or they don't bother to is because as soon as you apply some sort of layer over to do that kind of thing to um, force a particular device to a particular port every time, it makes Linux that little more brittle 
that if something has to change, then you're going to break things. So Linux likes to live by the idea that it's better to be constantly breaking than breaking legacy sort of setups. I, I'm, I'm not describing it right, but uh, they just would rather not be set in stone kind of thing. And when you do start putting layers like that on it does sort of start to set it in stone and Linux really does not like you doing that. As in the philosophy of Linux, the developers, all that sort of thing. Well, this appears to be charging one point Given that it's pretty much at the end of the charge curve, it's doing all right. It's up to 95, so it's definitely working. So this is all fixed and running. I just need to basically, uh, what do you call it, ultrasonic the board. Hope that it works after the ultrasonic. You may think I'm mocking, but I'm not. There is a probably about a 5% rate of boards going into the ultrasonic working and coming out not working and sadly enough a lot of them that come out not working are the dreaded with the 165s are the dreaded case where it will spin for 30 uh, 10 seconds stop and then keep spinning thereafter and that's something i still have not found a fix for i've got two boards here doing that and i'm desperately trying to find out what's causing it I'm hoping I can find a solution because it does come up more often than I like. Alright, just get this out. I should probably put the job number on this one. that SD port as well and see whether it's corrosion in there or something else that I'm missing ow it's a little warm actually funnily enough I do have more machines to repair but it's 11.30 and I don't quite yet have the stamina back to be doing late night jobs and I've got to take a trip into Townsville tomorrow and I will be picking up a bunch of cabinets as well at least one cabinet because at the moment the problem I've got where well, I was talking about where we can't do anything even though we own the house uh, I need desperately need some sort of protective storage for jobs that are coming in or going out and so I'm just going to get myself a four shelf lockable cabinet. It should do the trick. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah, I need stuff. I don't get much sleep. My leg keeps me awake at night. As soon as I try to start going to sleep, my sciatic nerve just kicks in and it's a long, hard fight until about 6 in the morning, sometimes 4.30 if I'm lucky, and eventually I just pass out from exhaustion and then the whole game starts again from about 9.30. Alright, let's have a look at this uh, SD slot and see if there's any indications. That is a mighty clean slot, but in saying that, the fact that there's basically no contact wear or anything, oh, that's a bit sus. It may just have been oxidization going on, and it just needed a few cycles of inserting and removing to break that oxidization. Oh, 
I'll give it another test after it's gone through the ultrasonic but I can't see any you know it does work it just took a few ins and outs to get it to agree to reading it okay Let's put the job number on this too and I usually like to put it on a piece of metal as well there we go well Andrew it's got to go through the ultrasonic anyway so I may as well just see how that pans out people may think I'm being a bit silly putting the number codes on everything but honestly <laughs> After you've mixed and matched parts accidentally a few times, you start to appreciate putting your number, the job number on everything. Alright. Okay then, well, that's it for this evening. So thank you very much for being here, everybody. And hopefully over time we'll get to spice up the uh, videos a little more. But for now, I'm just happy to be back and rolling at least at some level. And I will uh, catch up with you perhaps in another couple of days. I can't predict anything. Guess we'll uh, wait until I'm looking at you next. Until then, you'll take care. I'll see you later.